boy, sure can't wait to dive into this taco platter. Ah, shoot, forgot my soda pop. Just stick those right there for safekeeping. Hopefully that should be not a problem. Nobody will eat those, correct? Taco. <gasps> what the hell? My loco grande combo. Where'd she go? <sighs> Wait, what is that noise? What? No, it can't be. Miss me. I knew it! Frankabel is back, and he's after my tacos. Well, I will not let this stand. That's right, I'm back, baby. Oh, yeah. Jesus, Frankabel, you scared the crap out of me. Give me back my tacos, you bastard. I regret to inform you that I have already eaten all of your tacos. Mm. That was the last delicious morsel. No, Taco C. Ah, I'm the most evil of them all. <laughs> hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this inning explained, we'll be looking at the newest entry in the Conjuring universe. Annabelle Comes Home, where the infamous evil doll brings the Warren's haunted artifact room to life, unleashing a torrent of different spirits. And it's in the hands of three young girls, including the Warren's daughter, Judy, to stop the mayhem. Tactically, the seventh entry in the Conjuring universe after the tangentially related Curse of La Llorona earlier this year, Annabelle Comes Home continues to show signs that there isn't much life left in the series at this point. The main problem is that it just isn't scary at all, and it has become reliant on the same kinds of scares since the beginning, with diminishing returns each time. Now with Annabelle 3 feeling a lot more watered down and less terrifying than ever before. Almost like it's attempting to target a younger audience. And as others have pointed out, this feels more like an extended Goosebumps episode rather than anything following in the footsteps of the two Conjuring films, still the high watermark of the series by a mile. To me, a big part of what makes a horror movie actually scary is whatever our characters are facing has to be an actual threat. As in, if you encounter the evil spirit or what have you, there's a chance that it could kill you, thusly putting our characters in legitimate danger. The series isn't really known for having a high body count, relying more on scares than gore, which I don't have a problem with, yet it was the previous Annabelle creation that boasted the series' most gruesome violence and kills. Still, only like two, but you know, that counts. And again, it makes us actually feel afraid for the characters. The horror and scares work because the threat is legitimate. And the black skinned demon guy they introduced that was working through the Annabelle doll was pretty scary to boot. Which is not the case in the latest entry. We're told that the Warren's artifact room is full of the most evil shit imaginable, yet there isn't a single casualty in the entire movie. How evil is this stuff really if no one is in danger? Literally, a chicken is the only thing killed. That's it. No one even gets injured or anything. It's ridiculous. The movie is much more interested in rapidly introducing a whole bunch of new spirits and spooks, one after another, in strung together sequence that build up to a jump scare. The intention is clearly to provide a bunch of new spirits to potentially feature in more future spin-offs in the series, since they've already exhausted all the ones introduced so far, except for the Crooked Man, which is actually a real shame. Where is his movie, dang it? The issue with the new spirits is that they, for the most part, aren't very interesting. It's like in their one scene a piece allotted, there's not much else to do with the characters. There's only enough depth for the little bit seen on display, not leaving us with questions about them or interest to be further developed or expanded into a feature. The one interesting one is a kind of haunted TV that shows us a few seconds into the future. It's actually pretty different than the normal ghost on display in the series, and the uniqueness of it makes it stand out. A kind of sci-fi twist on things. However, otherwise, the new crew just doesn't measure up. The thing that really sucks is that the idea itself of Annabelle bringing the Warren's artifact room to life is a solid idea, brimming with much potential to unleash terror. And guess who gets a story credit? James Wan, who was the mastermind behind the first two Conjuring films. Every entry he didn't direct on his own has been a disappointment, except, oddly enough, again, Annabelle 2. That one really surprised me, especially because the first one was so crappy. And with the upcoming Conjuring 3 moving into the hands of Michael Chavez, who brought us the competent but forgettable La Llorona, it's starting to look like the series is doomed to become a shadow 
of its former self. Point is, get James Wan back. We need him. And considering Annabelle Comes Home opened with the lowest opening weekend of the series so far, even lower than Yorana, which they actively tried to avoid saying was part of the series, it's becoming more and more obvious the series is in need of some serious retooling. All right, now that we have all my thoughts of the movie out of the way, let's get into the latest and biggest Annabelle story yet breaking down what happens, where it fits into the series timeline, all of the many new spirits introduced, as well as the ending and what comes next in the series. Chronologically in the series, we pick up right at the opening prelude of The Conjuring in 1971, where the Warrens were first given the cursed Annabelle doll by a group of nursing students, concerned over several supernatural occurrences that seem tied to the doll. The Warrens get a taste of how powerful she really is when bringing the doll back home. They are stopped by a traffic incident, and the psychic Lorraine catches a glimpse of the female victim near the wreck. Coming to a cemetery, their car suddenly breaks down right at the gates. Ed goes to investigate, and the young woman appears in the car next to Annabelle, telling Lorraine that she likes the doll. Then seeing she's not the only spirit around, a whole group of them gathering at the cemetery. One shoves Ed into the road, causing him to nearly get splattered by a semi barreling right for him, luckily rolling out of the way just in the nick of time. The driver explains that it felt he suddenly lost control of the truck, and Lorraine realizes that it must be Annabelle responsible. And based Based on all the spirits that are all around, she is actually a beacon or conduit of sorts to other spirits, somehow instinctively drawn to the doll. Hoping to avoid any further incidents, they construct a case made out of glass from a church to house her, and have a priest bless her before locking her away. Jumping to 1972, putting us after the events of The Conjuring and just before Conjuring 2. At this point, the Warrens are starting to get some notoriety for their work, though in a negative way, as it's believed that they are hucksters and their demon hunting is merely a hoax. This hits especially especially hard for the Warren's young daughter Judy, as word about her parents' work has gotten out, she finds herself shunned and isolated at school. Kids turning down invitations to her upcoming birthday party, and others cruelly mocking her. Though she must know the truth that it's all very real, at least through what she's learned from her parents, but also due to the fact that just like her mother, Judy is starting to see spirits for herself. She at least has one friend to stick up for her. Her babysitter Mary Ellen, who is going to be taking care of Judy for the weekend, as her parents are off on yet another case. Judy's birthday they happens to be the same weekend. And even if the kids at school are jerks, Mary Ellen does her best to make it a fun time for her, going along with her trouble starting friend Daniela to the store for supplies to make a cake. They're running into Bob, who has the unfortunate nickname Bob's Got Balls. And it turns out Mary Ellen is smitten with him, which gets unceremoniously revealed by Daniela. Thanks a lot, buddy. Appreciate it. Daniela seems suspiciously interested in Mary Ellen's weekend at the Warren's house, and we see why that is later that evening, when she shows up uninvited with the intention of investigating the Warren's infamous haunted artifact room. Gifting Judy a pair of roller skates, Mary Ellen takes her out to try them out, leaving Daniela all alone in the house. The door to the artifact room is understandably under lock and key, sending Daniela through the house in search of them, finding them in Ed's office behind a picture of Jesus. Probably should have put those somewhere a little harder to find Ed, considering what's in there. Entering the room, she checks out the various haunted items on display, and here setting up all the various things that will soon come to life. Taking an object called a mourner's bracelet, which is said to allow someone to communicate with the dead. Daniel calls out for a sign of a presence there with her, specifically looking for her deceased father, contacting him being the whole reason for her wanting to come in the first place. There's no sign of him, but another presence makes itself known as she's just about to leave the room. Hearing a thump, she sees that Annabelle has tipped forward in her case. And even with that big fat warning sign saying to positively never open the case, the foolish Daniela does so anyway, placing the doll back into its chair. But before being able to close the door, a Smoke alarm upstairs sends her away. Whoops, forgot about the birthday cake. And after she leaves, Annabelle falls right out of her case onto the ground. Now the fun can begin. Off on her own, Judy spots Annabelle sitting in a rocking chair before vanishing, soon followed by the appearance of our first new spirit, the bride, wearing a blood splattered wedding dress and wielding a big ass knife. She stalks Judy around the house, grabbing a cross and screaming, alerting the other girls to come to her aid. She explains to them what she saw, revealing that the dress the bride wears is said to corrupt the person wearing it. Daniela, ever the unwelcome snooper, rifles through the Warren's case files, learning of more spirits they'll soon encounter, including a man who claimed he was a werewolf, or specifically hellhound, as well as the fairy man, who takes coins in exchange for the souls of the dead. He's definitely an homage to Charon from Greek mythology, the ferryman of Hades that led the dead over from our world into the afterlife via the river Styx. And quite oddly, the girl in the case file bears a striking resemblance to Mary Ellen, even though it was taken many years before she was alive. 
life. We don't get any further information on that. That's that's just a random coincidence. The girls are already a little on edge after reading the files. But Daniela is interested in another case, inquiring to Judy about Annabelle. But she's too terrified to even talk about her. And Daniela's probably like, oh, that's not good. Probably shouldn't have opened the case. Even though the multiple locks and big fat warning sign made it pretty clear to stay away, you dum-dum. A knock at the front door terrifies Mary Ellen, who cautiously approaches. I guess totally forgetting that she ordered a pizza a while back. And it's not even a ghost or nothing, but just Bob. Invited to come over by Daniela. Wow, she is really doing her own thing here. Sure, just unleash evil spirits and invite over whoever the hell you want, lady. The pizza arrives as well, and the stone delivery guy gives Bob some sage advice when picking up on the fact that he's into Mary Ellen, suggesting to woo her with music. Yeah, I bet this guy's got some rhythm. The girls get to work on cutting the burnt birthday cake, Judy inviting the girls to her upcoming birthday party, both promising to be there. Wow, they're friends now, isn't that great? They then hear Bob putting his plan into action, serenading Mary Ellen from outside. But before she gets down to talk to him, the heavy fog surrounding the house begins to materialize into the form of a werewolf, the shape manifesting from the misty clouds. Bob flees in terror, taking shelter in a chicken coop where he is safe. But a poor chicken isn't as lucky, mindlessly wandering outside and becoming werewolf lunch. And this, as I mentioned, is literally the only kill in the entire film. A chicken. That was it, folks. Pure evil at every corner, and the only fatality is a chicken. Putting Judy to bed, she asks about what happened to Daniela's father, and Mary Ellen explains that he died in a car accident. Daniela was actually driving, and due to this, feels herself responsible for her father's death. This at least helps us understand a bit more why she was so hell-bent at getting into the artifact room, desperate to communicate with her dad's spirit. Which again, at least makes her look a little less stupid than on initial inspection. She's been driven by her overwhelming grief. Another visitor comes a-knocking at the door. The spirit of the real Annabelle, the little girl who tragically died, and whose story was seen in Annabelle creation. She asks if Annabelle can come out to play. And as we've seen so far, the doll is already playing its games with the girls. Elsewhere, Daniela is beckoned back into the artifact room as the door opens on its own. Haven't you done enough in there already? Ugh. Here she does see her father's spirit in the reflection of a mirror, but when turning to face him, his appearance becomes mutilated and he angrily blames her for his death. Clearly the spirits are trying to break her down to be able to possess her later as we see in a bit. Attempting to escape, the door locks, and she is trapped inside. Pacing the room, she encounters a 50s-style looking television that flips itself on, displaying an almost mirror-live image of right now, but it is actually transmitting a few seconds into the future, showing her movements just a bit before they actually happen. But the real terror begins when an accordion-holding monkey falls off the shelf behind her. Oh my god, it's a monkey with an accordion! Pure evil! Boy, sure can't wait for that accordion monkey spin-off movie. That'll, that'll be good. In our next Spirit Showcase spinoff, we have Mary Ellen encountering the Ferryman. Several coffins appear, stuffed with bodies, pennies on their eyes all around the house. The Ferryman tossing out coins from the darkness towards her, which goes on for about five freaking minutes too long, just her walking around and coins coming out at her. Until we get to the big jump scare for the Ferryman, terrifying her with his skeletal appearance. But a whip of her flashlight makes the spirit vanish. Well, that could have been scary if something, you know, actually happened, instead of the bitch-ass ghost just being like boo and disappearing again. Rushing to Judy's room, the door is sealed closed. Inside, she's still asleep in bed until she's awoken by something pulling on her leg. Looking down into the sheets, the doll is there waiting. She throws it across the room, but of course has no effect. Seeing in one of the more clever moments visually, through spinning colored lights, casting silhouettes on the wall. First of Annabelle rising, followed by the young girl spirit, and finally that horned demon that uses Annabelle as a conduit. Again, the actually pretty scary looking dude that was introduced in creation. And stuff is getting cuckoo enough for them to finally reach the point of realizing what the heck is going on, attempting to contact the Warrens on the phone. At first, it does sound like Lorraine on the other end, until her voice turns distorted and sinister, informing the girls that the doll wants a soul. Still trapped in the artifact room, Daniela has another encounter with the spooky TV, again showing a few seconds after now, seeing on screen Daniela answering a phone, and then flashing to her covered in blood and screaming. And right on cue, on our side, the phone begins to ring. Before answering the phone, the other girl managed to get inside and get her out of there. So if she had answered the call, this would have led to her death, which would have I would have liked to see that because it would have been interesting to see how it works. Since the girls stopped this, they were able to save her with seconds to spare. See, again, they actually left me with questions. I don't know what would have happened or how she would have been killed. There's more to the character than we were given in the two seconds on screen. And Daniela finally comes clean about what she did in the room and that she touched pretty much everything in there. Judy knows that it is Annabelle responsible for all the spirits appearing, as again, the doll acts as a 
conduit for other spirits, essentially letting the spirits come out and possess the artifacts through her. The paranormal activity reaches a fever pitch as everything comes to life all at once. The girls separated once again so they can each encounter a different one one by one. Spirit showcase, great. Daniela is stalked by the bride, while Judy gets to encounter the hellhound outside. He materializes and chases after her, but thanks to a hit in the face from Bob's guitar, it disappears. Man, that is one lame werewolf. But the bottom of the barrel is the haunted samurai armor that Mary Ellen has to tend with, which actually doesn't take much effort whatsoever. You think, oh, maybe it's got a sword coming at you, me like a warrior and shit, but it literally doesn't even move. As Mary Ellen cautiously passes by, we do hear the screams of those the wearer has killed, but that's it. Its biggest threat is simply that it could fall over on you and crush you due to its weight. Even the spooky haunted board game, Feely Mealy is scarier than him. Demon hands popping out and trying to attack Judy and Mary Ellen, though they managed to get the key to Annabelle's case that was contained inside. While Daniela is still being terrorized by the bride, and in fact, the bride does get her, literally stabbing her in the gut with her knife, yet it didn't actually happen. For a second, I was legitimately like, whoa, that was a surprise. I didn't think she'd actually get killed. And guess what? She doesn't. Though she does become possessed by the bride's spirit, donning her wedding dress and taking her knife, frantically attacking the other girls. However, just as quickly as she's possessed, it is undone, as Judy plays a film recording of Ed doing an exorcism, and this is enough to force his bride's spirit out of Daniela's body. Easy peasy exercising demons, it turns out, and phew! Good thing that footage was perfectly queued up, or otherwise they might have been in real trouble. Now they just have to set about putting Annabelle back in her case to stop all the mayhem. And as Lorraine told Judy earlier, not all spirits are evil, and the specter of a pastor from her school guides them to Annabelle's location. But before they can get her, the black-skinned demon appears, slamming Judy against the wall, and begins to suck her soul away. She repels him with a cross, and he's gone. Just gone. That's all it takes, I guess. Big evil demon guy. How about a cross? No way, dude. Later. They finally lock Annabelle back in the case, and all the supernatural activities activity immediately ceases, the spirits all returning to their respective artifacts. Bob's okay too, great news. The next morning on the way out, Bob invites her to homecoming and she says, yes! Oh my god, you guys, how exciting. Later, Ed and Lorraine return home just in time for Judy's official birthday party. But oh no, no one at school wanted to go because of her parents being weirdos until Mary Ellen and Daniela arrive, bringing in tow all of her classmates. Ah, how heartwarming. A bunch of people that aren't really my friends come to my birthday party. Huzzah! Ah, best birthday ever. At the party, Lorraine takes Daniela aside, not to scold her for being responsible for Annabelle or putting her daughter in danger or anything like that, but to inform her that she has spoken to her father's spirit, saying that he misses her and to stop blaming herself for what happened, giving her the mourner's bracelet and the two hug as Daniela tears up, finally letting go of the guilt she felt for her father's death, as well as her for some reason being the only character to have any kind of arc whatsoever in the movie. Uh, it really was more Daniela's movie than anyone else. No one else even really did anything except her. And that's pretty much it as the two get back to the party, the movie ends. I would have liked to see more with Judy and her mom, especially in the aftermath of what happened, and kind of having Judy taking on the mantle of her mom as a demonologist. I know she's young, but it would have been cool to see them establish this a lot more than we were given, which wasn't really anything at all. This bringing us to the next entries in the Conjuring universe. The only confirmed one is the long-awaited Conjuring 3, coming in fall 2020, though there is also a non-sequel in production as well. And of course, the still even longer delayed Crooked Man movie. Seriously, what is taking so long? I'll write the dang thing if I have to. Scant details are known about Conjuring 3 so far, beyond it potentially featuring another real-life Warren case. The trial of a man for murder who claimed he was possessed by a demon, and that the devil made him do it. We also don't know about Judy or if she'll even be in the movie at all, but what I would have liked to have seen with this movie is to act as a kind of important chapter in a bigger story. Story. Here establishing the daughter Judy and sort of an MCU style, have her come back in a later entry like Conjuring 3, but now a little more grown up and evolved into a demonologist thanks to her experiences in this movie. They didn't do this, and this would have been a really satisfying thing to see the steps with here, but again they were obviously more interested in making a spin-off sequel spawning haunted house movie more than anything else. Which brings us to the conclusion of this ending explained for the disappointing Annabelle Comes Home. Ah well, hopefully the Conjuring 3 will be strong enough to get everything back on track, but we'll have to wait until 2020 to find out for sure. As I really am pulling for this big budget mainstream horror franchise, there's still tons of potential to make something really interesting and special that also makes money. And I hope Warner Brothers can figure out that balance sometime soon. 
probably need to get some new blood creatively in there, I'd say, instead of just getting Gary Doberman to do everything now. Seriously, that guy does every Warner Brothers horror movie now. It's ridiculous. Give him a break, maybe. I don't know, find someone else. Again, if you guys want me to write the Crooked Man movie, Give me a ring of a ding dong or hit me up on Twitter, whatever. They won't do that. What did you guys think of Annabelle Comes Home and its ending? Do you agree with my opinion of the movie? What do you hope to see in The Conjuring 3? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.